um, a skeptical view on decomposition attacks. And um, well, let's just start. And um, just to um, recall again, another time, uh, we use additive notation in, uh, in these presentations. So the discrete logarithm problem is written additively. Uh, and um, we consider um, what is called uh, decomposition attacks. And um, so the input is an instance of the discrete logarithm problem. And um, let's say for simplicity, uh, the group is cyclic and A is a generator. And um, we uh, do as follows. We first of all compute the group order. Then we fix what is classically called a factor base, might now also be called a decomposition base. We compute these so-called relations. That is exactly the same thing as what Igor Semaev presented in the previous talk. He used multiplicative notation, but then he also applied it in additive notation. Just to recall, we use additive notation. And um, we um, form a matrix here by um, basically um, writing these equations um, as rows. And um, we uh, sum up the equations in such a way that we get zero on the right hand side. We do this by computing an element of the right kernel, left kernel, sorry, left kernel of this matrix. And then we obtain this um, relation between these input elements. And if we're a little bit lucky, we can invert here modular the group order and we can output the discrete log with them. So, <clears throat> um, so this is uh, the general presentation. So this is actually, in fact, um, really very closely related to the method by Krajcik, um, which was already pointed out as nearly uh, 100 years ago. And by the way, Krajcik was actually a Polish mathematician who lived in Belgium and then later moved to the United States. And, um, and, and, and by the way, also another thing, um, uh, Krajcik was being praised for being both a mathematician and a good computer, and it was said that that was something non-trivial. And probably that is also true. Um, okay, so... Um, so we do this, and so this is exactly the method by Krajcik, essentially, um, a little bit, um, well, um, nicely formulated in additive notation. So let's call it now a decomposition attack, because of, uh, in our application at least, because what really is the most important point is here the decomposition. And uh, so this decomposition, well, it is basically the same thing as a factorization, but a non-unique factorization. So um, uh, decomposition is probably an appropriate name. So first, um, now let's consider the problem of computing these um, decompositions. So um, we have some point and we want to decompose. Or we can also write it like this, and this was uh, the presentation by Semaev, and that, was act that is actually uh, what we want to do here because this M will be fixed in our applications and elliptic curves. So we have an... Um, elliptic curve over an extension field given here. And let's recall that um, uh, every curve, every point has, of course, an x-coordinate, and the x-coordinate determines the point up to uh, sine. So um, the um, definition of the factor base in this situation here is given by a um, subvector space and then a restriction on the x-coordinates. So, and um, the decomposition is then, of course, um, as indicated here. And um, you have uh, usually a relation in the sense that m times the dimension of u is about equal to n. And um, we do that by um, expanding everything over fq over the small field, which might, for example, be f2, as in the previous talk, and with polynomial system. Okay. So um, it was already mentioned in the previous talk. Um, following um, the preprint by Igor Semaev, I got interested in this problem, and then I was um, able to derive um, this result here, which can be indicated as follows. Let's consider this red line here, um, and let's somehow um, expand this red line a little bit to the left and to the right, and then if you go on this red line, you get what is called a sub-exponentiality result, because you have e to the group Here's the group order, uh, but it's the um, logarithm of the group order, so it can be called the size. And then you have an exponent which is larger than one in the exponent. And here the same uh, thing um, between the 
two blue lines. So you have this sector here. And I have some other heuristic results. So you can have larger sector here and basically all go all the way up nearly to like straight up um, and you will still be heuristically speaking um, sub-exponential. Um, now, in this talk, I want to be a little bit uh, skeptical, even though I have this asymptotic result, and the uh, reason is we want to do this now in practice. And in practice, I think there's a completely different story. And this is what I want to talk about. And um, so um, let's um, consider the most important problem here, namely the solving of these polynomial systems. So the most easy case is really you have n plus one variables and n equations and have um, um, here n polynomials and then geometry says that generally speaking um, the number of solution is given by multiplying the degrees of these equations. Okay, but that is now over the algebraic closure. And now there are algorithms um, which can compute all these solutions, all these solutions, that is all these field extensions, um, with all these solutions in a time which is polynomial in the number of solutions over finite fields. That can be done um, with a randomized algorithm. And the point is that this is actually optimal in a certain sense because, you know, this here is the output size, and this is then polynomial in the output size, and so, therefore, you cannot really have a much faster algorithm, except you can just discuss the constant here. Yeah? Um, so I want, to, um, I want to maybe take the time, this is actually appropriate, to make a remark um, on something Igor Semaev just said, on solving um, polynomial systems. Um, let's uh, first of all say this is a very, um, uh, it's a subject with a long history, and um, a lot of people have um, done a lot of work here, and um, so there's a whole community. And um, so what uh, people are particularly interested in is the following. What if the system is very well structured? So uh, you impose some, um, some, basically that means some monomials are present, but some other monomials are not present. So what, uh, what people do, I tell you the story now from a mathematical point of view, is um, if you, if you do a structured system, for example, you multiply some kind of variables with some other kind of variables, um, then if you do this, then you, in, in a naive way, so, um, try to look at the solution set in projective space, you will get some higher dimensional components always. And that is not what you want, so you want to eliminate these. And for this, people use so-called toric varieties, and um, they um, make uh, some algorithms based on these, and they are based on so-called toric resultants. And they then have also this kind of optimal running time. So this means an, um, a running time which uh, is generically speaking, which is a polynomial in what is expected to be generically the number of solutions in projective space. Now, these algorithms are actually very closely related to what Igor Semaev presented on his last slides. So, um, and, um, and, um, so I, ju I just wanted to I just want to point this out. Uh, these uh, these algorithms where you have um, you know you linearize the equation, but then you have also the um, uh, the, the variables. So for example, x1, x2 is now x1 times x2 is now a, a quadratic variable. Uh, sorry, a linear variable, and so on. You do this. Uh, so these are these kind of algorithms. You do it. You one can do it like this. This can, for example, be found in the book by Cox, Little Oshia. Okay, so now um, I will just continue with my talk anyway, even without slides. Um, so um, the next question which can be asked is, what if you have um, uh, more equations than unknowns? What happens then? And this is where the so-called semi-regularity comes in. So there are some conjectures, and Igor Semaev actually presented this already completely. For example, this is the only thing which is important for my talk. If you have double as many equations as variables, and the equations are, for example, quadratic, you still get an exponential running time. <clears throat> Next question is, what if I'm just interested in solutions over the uh, particular finite field, for example, F2, and not over the algebraic closure? Well, the answer is, just introduce the field equations, for example, x1 squared equal to x1, and so on and so forth, so that 
means you have uh, really just introduced n more equations if you have n more n variables. So, um, so this comes down to the previous case where you have more variables than equations. And then yeah, there's another very interesting question. And this question is, in fact, uh, what if I'm just interested in a single solution or whether there exists a solution at all? If I am interested in this, then it gets really interesting because now the output size is, of course, very, very small. So there is no, there is no you know, restriction concerning the output size. So is there a better algorithm now? And then the answer is, well, that's really not known. And, and, so, and this is a major open uh, research problem, I would say. And what is actually really interesting is that um, if you do that over the real numbers, and, and then, of course, you cannot compute a solution because, you know, I mean, you can just approximate some solutions, but say you want to approximate a solution, just one solution, and that can be done. That can be done with some iterative methods, like Newton method. And this is also a very, very deep result that this can be done. I mean, Newton method is not deep, but that this method can be made in such a way that you can actually prove that you can always approximate a single solution in polynomial time. This is a deep result. And, and that holds over the real numbers, but that doesn't hold over finite fields. OK. Um, so what shall we do now? Um, okay, I think I'll just continue anyway. Um, right. Um, <clears throat> so, going coming back to the uh, elliptic curve um, discrete logarithm problem. Um, by the way, are um, Stephen and um, yes, they, they're still, they're still, they're they're still listening. Well, that is fine. Um, Coming back to the discrete logarithm problem, I want to now discuss uh, very, um, two different cases. Namely, first of all, the case of large characteristic, and second of all, the case of characteristic two. So, in large characteristic, uh, just do this very briefly. Um, um, yeah, well, this is basically where my, my where my theorem is in. Large characteristic just means, by definition, you cannot use the field equations because they're so large you will never reach this degree in these in these uh, computations with these polynomial uh, um, systems. For example, which are, by the way, done by Grebner basis, but from a theoretical point of view, they are done with resultants. Okay. So large characteristic means field equations are not useful. And then one can, for example, in, uh, use the summation polynomials introduced by Igor Semai. And for example, just consider a special case. Just consider the case you have an elliptic curve over f2 to the power n. And, um, and just say that um, you restrict the x coordinates of a point just to a line. Okay, or f, no, sorry, fq to the n, not f2 to the n because 2 is not small. You have f2, fq to the power n, fq to the power n, and you just restrict x coordinates to a line. Okay? Klaus, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, because of uh, technical problems with the projector, uh, we uh, offer a uh, five minute technical break, yeah? Okay, but let me just uh, anyway finish this ah, okay, um, this, okay, uh, this somehow slide, and then we can we can continue. Um, so you restrict um, just the x coordinates to just a line, okay? And the characteristic is large, mm -hmm. and um, then you can use different techniques to solve this. For example, with the summation polynomials, and the complexity will be something like two to the n square. 2 to the n square. And this is a very large number. 2 to the n square is a very large number. Okay? So this is obviously much worse than just doing, um, you know, um, well, it's obviously much worse than, for example, uh, exponent, I mean, sim sing single exponential, two, 2 to the n. So it's 2 to the n square. So, um, and, um, and the question arises now, is there somehow an easier way? For example, it's with some other kind of system. And, and the answer is not really. And what I want to point out is there is some underlying geometry which actually forces the number of solutions to be this number, 2 to the n square, or around this number. You can maybe a little bit play around with it. But it is still somehow close to this number, and there is some underlying geometry, and it doesn't really matter how you write down the system, you will always end up with this complexity because that's simply the number of solutions. Okay, and um, 
Now, I, next thing is I will talk about uh, characteristic two, but then for that, we first of all make the break. This is uh, what I said before. Here is this uh, system and uh, which, want to, uh, which we want to solve, and these, um, these are a number of solutions. After some symmetrization here, I have to say, and uh, then this is the running time. One can try to have make some further symmetrizations here, but uh, still, I want to say, um, apart from this, actually, I, I should say, um, it is not really helpful, I would say, to try to come up with some other solution method because there is an invariant complexity given here by the geometry. Okay. Um, that's, of course, an opinion. You can, of course, still try, but uh, I recommend against it. Um, <laughs> so now, um, Igor Semaev um, had his um, preprint last year, and in this preprint, he um, conjectured that um, decompositions can be computed in polynomial time. Now we see uh, it evolved a little bit over time, so he doesn't make so strong conjecture anymore, but still consider this conjecture. Because he said, you know, um, the, um, this uh, degree up to which you have to go up for the Grobner-based computation is bounded by four. Or maybe it's a little bit larger, but anyway, um, if, if, if it's constant, if it is bounded by some constant, then you will get um, some algorithm in polynomial time. And um, now, then he uh, derives some um, asymptotic result. And for this asymptotic result, you have to consider a, a probability, namely the probability that for some input point you obtain such a, um, such a decomposition. Okay? And this probability is about 1 over m factorial. And the reason for this is essentially, if you have one of these decompositions, you have m factorial of these because of symmetry, and so you simply don't have enough combinations left um, to reach all points. So this is why you get a 1 over m factorial in average. Actually, to be more precise, one should say the expected value of decomposition should be about 1 over m factorial. So, and then he obtains this result. And this result is exactly of the same form as the classical result um, for the finite prime fields. So you have exactly the same kind of result. And that is actually, in fact, not a coincidence, because you know you have polynomial time relation generation. You have the same kind of probability theoretic problem now. And now I'm going to argue that if this is correct, then there is, in fact, a polynomial time algorithm to solve the elliptic curve disk with logarithm problem. So I repeat, if this is correct, this in particular here, not just this result, but this here, then there is a polynomial time algorithm. So now you can make up your mind. You can say, well, I believe that uh, you can have these decompositions in polynomial time, and I think then you should also argue, uh, accept my arguments, which I will present, that then there is also a polynomial time algorithm. Or you might also say, well, that is completely weird, and I don't believe that, so therefore, um, in all likelihood, um, this conjecture here is not correct. I leave that up to you. And um, so I just say, and now comes my variant. So this is what Igor Semaev does. He fixes the subvector space and considers this decomposition. And what I just do is, I just, I not only just consider one vector space, I consider several ones. And I do the decompositions like this. So now I don't have this problem of repetition anymore because all these x coordinates lie in different spaces. So it is, in fact, not possible to do any symmetry here. So I do it like this, and then the um, probability is very high. It can be made really very, very high, nearly one, or maybe say at least a constant apart from one. And now I can go to the real full extreme, which is actually allowed by the conjecture by Semaev in, um, in his preprint. I can also um, just say, well, the x coordinates should just be given by a line. But what is a line in F2? A line in F2 is just a point which is not zero and zero. Okay, and zero is actually not so important because, you know, I want to have, 
I consider points with a particular x coordinate, and there might not even be a point with x coordinate zero. And my method doesn't really depend on this at all. So that means actually, I just fix x coordinates of points. That's what I do. And now I can just forget everything, and I can just reformulate this in a very, very easy way. And I can just say, given these input instances, I just want to have a decomposition might, might more appropriately be called a representation of B in that form that is here with these shifting signs. You know, I mean, I fix the x coordinate of A and as said in the beginning, x fixing the x coordinate of a point determines the point up to a sign, and so on and so forth. I did it here like this with the n minus 3, such that if this exists, it is actually unique. And the number of um, points you can reach like this is at least a quarter of all points. And um, you can also put a B on the other side. You have a really very nice um, form. And in fact, uh, now, um, actually, in fact, you just have to test if, if, if this, something like this holds. And then you can also solve this grid logarithm problem. And for example, you can just put it into a summation polynomial and then just test. And then you have uh, solved the uh, discrete logarithm problem. Well, but uh, that is a very bad idea because the summation polynomials are so complex. But now we can uh, use uh, Semaev's idea and um, split this up into polynomials of uh, summation polynomials, third summation polynomials. So I just introduced the new variables. So this holds over every kind of field. You know, over every field, even over a prime field. And um, so, and this here now is a polynomial which is quadratic in X1. And these polynomials are quadratic in, in these uh, variables, x1 and x2, and so on and so forth. Over f2, I can actually expand this. And then this quadratic polynomial becomes actually a linear polynomial. So it's really easy. And now, here some squares disappear as well. So basically, you just have some you know, variables by, multiplied by some other variables. So it's really very easy. And in fact, it is quadratic. It is not degree 3. Yes, in the previous talk, it's actually degree 2. So it's actually easier. So this is one reason why you should say, if you believe the previous uh, conjecture, then you should also believe that this can be solved in polynomial time because it's actually easier. Yeah, it has the same structure, but actually it's easier. And um, so I ran the experiment, and the largest experiment I could do was for n equal to 11, and the largest degree reached was 3. So that is uh, somehow uh, very impressive, I would say. Somehow, if you believe that 4 is small, then 3 is actually even smaller. I used a 30 gigabyte, which is not so impressive. Um, I will come to it late, maybe later, or we can have a discussion on this 30 gigabyte. And also, with a semi-regularity, usually one sees that one should go, have to go up to degree 8. So actually, really, there is something going on. So independently, if you believe that this 3 is a constant for n equal to infinity or not, something goes on here. That is for sure. That's for sure correct. And um, now I want to tell you why I'm skeptical. So, and the reason is because we want to do that in practice now. In theory, it's actually really not very great because I can't prove anything here. And in practice, I would say it's also not that great. Um, because assume the best, assume that degree three suffices. And let's just see what that would mean. In practice, so you have n square um, equations, because you started with n equations over f2 to the n, you get n square equations over f2. You have to go up to degree 3. This is now the number of linear variables in degree 3. And you have to do linear algebra. And linear algebra, you know, um, has usually an exponent in practice, which is 3, given by Gauss elimination. Now you can use, for example, Strassen's algorithm, which has a smaller complexity, but this is larger than uh, two and a half. And I just, as a lower bound, assume that it is possible to do linear algebra with an uh, exponent of um, two and a half, which is actually an underestimation in practice. So I get an exponent which is 15. And I get here a table, for, for example, n equal to 10, um, 10 to the power 15 is 2 to the 50, and here is an more or less the running time of the row method, but it's a slight overestimation because I have the um, n square where actually, in fact, you can use the, do the arithmetic a little bit 
better. So you see, maybe there's a break even at n equal to 200, which is maybe good. As I said, probably even under this assumption here, in practice, the break even will be later. You know, um, so you know, I don't want to claim very strong result. I want to say that it is not really possible. You know, keep that in mind. <laughs> Okay, but anyway, that you might think that, well, that's interesting, at least potentially interesting. But now here's the really, really, really very bad news. You consider the storage, and you see, okay, you have these um, n square variables have to go up to degree 3, and then you have to store a matrix. And this matrix, I think, well, it will probably be more or less dense. So it is n to the uh, 12. For example, you plug in 100, you get 10 to the 24. Uh, which is uh, more than, um, which is more than uh, 10 to the 11 expressed in um, bytes, which is a so-called CETA byte. Ooh, well, that's really scary, and I just leave that for you, and I just stop here. And um, well, my speculation is, a computer with a CETA byte of RAM will never be built, or to say more or say it differently, I think it's more likely that a quantum computer will be built to solve the discrete logarithm problem elliptic curve than, um, than a computer with enough memory as indicated here. So thank you very much.